everyone, happy Thursday. And Thursday means that I'm on Twitter answering your questions. And today I have four, because yesterday's video was really, really long. Sorry, sometimes I ramble. So today, make it shorter, faster. Get through the questions in the journal topic. So stay tuned towards the end because I have a journal topic. And without further ado, question number one. What is the difference between a normal teenage mood swing and an actual mood disorder like bipolar disorder? Now this is a great question. This is something that I've even talked with my clients about. And the main difference is, first of all, having bipolar disorder, you can check out my bipolar video <clears throat> if you want more information on that. But usually when we have bipolar disorder, if we have mania, it lasts for at least one week. And the feelings that come along with mania, like extreme elevation of mood, lack of need for sleep, we can have psychotic features, um, as well as mixed episodes. In yesterday's video, I talked about what mixed episodes are and depressive symptoms. If we go into a major depressive episode, um, these things last for a significant portion of time. And even if we're a rapid cycler, which is a a part of bipolar disorder where we go in and out of mania or depression um, pr rather quickly, like every week or three weeks or something like that. When we are ha a teenager and we have mood swings, it's more hormonal. And it may be uh, once a month around our periods, we have, you know, PMS or PMDD. I have a video on that as well. Or we might have like rapid ups and downs during our day. And that's how I differentiate. I know that it's difficult to necessarily like to to tell the difference but that's what therapists and psychiatrists and physicians are for is because we know the criteria that we're looking for within our DSM and that's how we're going to differentiate a mood swing and hormonal monthly changes versus actual bipolar disorder and they are very different um, if you have concerns and you're worried about your mood swings or mood changes, if you think that it may be bipolar disorder, then make an appointment to see a psychiatrist or a therapist or even your GP if you need to get a referral, if that's the way your insurance works. Okay? Now, question number two. Do all people who self-harm have borderline personality disorder? No. It is very common. Self-harming is un one of the criteria under borderline personality disorder. Unfortunately, even though... Um, I tried to do my best to tell the um, APA that they need to add self-harm as its own diagnosis. At this point, it only lists it under borderline. But that doesn't mean that everybody that self-harms has it. Um, I have patients who don't have borderline who self-harm. I have patients who do that self-harm. It is only a portion of the diagnosis. You can meet other criteria without having that and, you know, vice versa. So, no, we don't. Not everybody who self-harms has BPD. <clears throat> Number three, what are some ways to keep dissociation at bay? One of the best things that my clients report helping is using your, your five senses. So what am I smelling? What am I feeling? A lot of times I'll have patients like um, hold a squeezy ball or have a blanket in my office and they can like feel the material and how it's woven together. Um, if we have scented candles, I can light those if they like the smell, different things like that. You can also have a visualization, it's a visualization technique where you focus on one image, like a grounding image, and it can be different for everybody. For one person, it could be the beach and the sound of the waves. For another person, it could be I'm at home in my bed curled up with my blanket or I'm hugging my best friend. It could be many different things, but make it something where you can visualize a moment, a situation, a place, and you can feel it. You can use your senses to feel it. And coming back to that visualization or that point or that time and place can help keep us together. And if any of you have other tips and tricks and things that work for you, please share them because I know this is something that a lot of us struggle with and it will be something I'll do other videos on, but the more tips and tricks we have, the better we are able to fight back and to stay grounded and present, okay? Number four, what are some tips to avoid comfort or emotional eating? The biggest and best thing that we can do is see someone. Now, I know you're like, Katie, but I don't wanna see anybody. Can't I just hide the stuff I eat or not buy it or whatever? And you can do that. You can not buy the items. You can make sure they're not in your house. You can ask your family not to purchase them and things like that. But trust me, we'll find a way. And however, if that's our outlet, then what do we have to do? We have to talk back to the voice 
that voice that's saying, um, you know, you're worthless, you're terrible. It's that eating disorder voice. We have to talk back to it. And we need to talk to someone. We need to vent. We need to get some constructive feedback. We need to put it all out there where we talk about what it means to to eat and what why it's comfort eating, what's comforting about it. Are there other ways we can comfort ourselves? I know nothing will replace it completely, but sometimes we can take like four things to do um, that comfort us that replace that one. Um, so those are my tips. And if any of you, as I like always, like I just said, if any of you have any other tips, please let us know and share. But that's what usually works the best because it's not just about the food. It's something else going on. And it may be our depression. It may be our anxiety. Whatever it is, we need to get some support for that. And you can check out my free eating disorder workbook. Task one is the talking back to that voice, and that will really, really help. So go to katiemorton.com and download that. Okay, now without further ado, the journal topic. Now this is really cool, and you can go to this site if you want more, more journal topics. But it's journaltherapy.com, and I thought this was so cool because I hear this all the time from you guys. Like, I don't really like to write in journals, and I don't know how to journal. Ah, it's terrible, right? But they had a really cool acronym that they used, and they said it's easy to write, W-R-I-T-E, that being their acronym. So this is the W is what do you want to write about? What's going on? How do you feel? What are you thinking about? What do you want? You name it, you write about it. R of the write is reflect or review. Close your eyes, take deep breaths, focus. You can start with I feel, I want, I think today or right now or in this moment. I is investigate. Investigate your thoughts and feelings. Start writing and keep writing. Follow the pen and keyboard. If you get stuck or run out of juice, just close your eyes and recenter yourself. Reread what you've already written and continue writing. T, time yourself. Write for 5 to 15 minutes. Write the start time and the projected end time at the top of the page. If you have an alarm or a timer, you know you can set it because then we're not expecting ourselves to just keep writing forever and ever. And then the last one is exit. Um, exit smart by rereading what you've written and reflecting on it in a sentence or two as like saying as I read this I notice or I'm aware or now I feel this and we kind of close it out so I hope that really helps and you can go to that website um, journaltherapy.com and check that out I thought that was really helpful so if any of you are having trouble um, journaling or getting started I hope that that helps you along okay have a wonderful evening everybody I love you all and I will see you tomorrow because guess what today tomorrow is it's Friday, and I'll be on Facebook, so make sure to ask your questions, and I'll see you then. Bye!